Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's uh, nice to have the graveyard shift. And um, what I want to do today is I've been asked to talk about resilience in the high mountains and mental well-being. And I suppose, really, when you think this is my normal day at work, uh, one has to look at my mental health uh, when it comes down to what I do for a living. However, I genuinely believe that uh, I have got the best job in the world. Uh, resilience to me was getting the overnight sleeper down to Euston and then getting the tube this morning. That really scared me uh, much more than this does. And what I do is I take people into the mountains and there's nothing better than battling through uh, the worst of Scottish conditions and then getting your clients safely to the top of a mountain. They got smiles on their faces and I really don't know whether it's just relief of fear or excitement. Some decide that mountaineering is the best thing they ever did in their life. Some decide they never want to do it again. But what I can say is that day out, or those several days, or it may be an expedition, has a massive effect on the people that you take out, and whether that's transferred into their work life or not. Uh, I was a teacher, and I always remember going into school on an afternoon uh, after I'd been out climbing, and if the kids were messing about, or were doing whatever, it didn't really matter, actually. Because I thought, you don't know where I was yesterday. It was probably death yesterday I was facing, not you teenagers. And they soon learned to shut up. And it was only a month ago um, that I was, took a group of people to Mount Elbrus. Mount Elbrus is the highest mountain in, in Europe. It's in Russia. And I've never been to this mountain, but that doesn't really matter, because one mountain's the same. All you have to do is go up. Okay, and there was 12 people on this expedition and on our first summit attempt, uh, the weather was absolutely horrendous. So horrendous that myself and the Russian guide here, Viktor, uh, decided we had to stop the show. Obviously, people have paid three and a half thousand pounds for this trip. Mount Elbrus, you don't go for the beautiful trekking. It's all about going to the top and that's what these people wanted. Obviously, they were gutted that we had to abort the summit attempt. But also, they were pretty relieved. And this lady here, Catherine, uh, she was more relieved than others because she had been pushed physically and emotionally totally out of her comfort zone. I remember getting down. And it was a bit like me when I was younger. She was in tears. I can't do that again. And there was me. I was straight down thinking about when we could go back for summit. We had a couple of days down. Catherine said, I don't want to go back. I really can't do this. And I said, Catherine, you can. She was fit, she was focused, and we went back two days later, and here we are on the summit. It was nearly as equally as bad conditions. But what these people had done in that first summit attempt is that they'd learned how to cope with bad conditions. They'd realized what they were going to face. They'd had some sort of experience about what it was going to be like. And there she is, Catherine. Uh, summited. She, she was my star of the trip, really. These other people did really well, but they had some experience. When I got back to the UK, uh, Catherine sent my boss um, some feedback. I was slightly worried. I was very worried about this word here. Okay, crazy. Because crazy to me means mad, insane. It means that I might have a mental illness. I don't know. But then when I looked at the sort of the synonyms of crazy, it was passionate, enthusiastic, focused. And I thought, hmm, I'm much more comfortable with those feelings. And then I looked on and saw that, um, yeah, I was a bit giddy. I'm a bit giddy when I'm not doing my job. But as soon as I go to the mountains and things actually need attention, I become this sort of different character. And uh, what was really important to me was that she felt safe and that I had interacted. Because part of my job as an expedition leader, and it's, it's come through today, is about how much we care about other people. Are we going to go in and say, in the morning, how are you? Yes? And this is what I do on expeditions. It's not been, I haven't been taught how to do it, but all I've realised is that I can get the most out of my team members if I know how they feel. Now, I said I wasn't going to say this. I've said this to somebody today, and I am on the graveyard shift, so I can swear. Um, I don't accept people when they say to me, I say, Adele, how are you? And they go, fine. And I say, well, do you know what fine means? And they go, no. 
What it means is effing incapable of a natural emotion. Because you're either good or you're bad or you're not feeling so great. And what I'm trying to do is by being an expedition leader is to try and get out of my clients exactly how they're feeling physically, but actually on an expedition that lasts for several months, your emotional well-being is much more important. So, how did I become this person? Um, when I was eight years old, my stepdad took me up Snowden. Put your hand up if you climb Snowden. Come on. Thank you very much. Great. And uh, we left my mum and my stepbrother who had muscular dystrophy at the caravan park, and we went off in the Mar Morris Maxi, so you can realise how long ago that was, and he took me out. He wasn't a mountaineer. And we started off on the easy track. I was like walking along, little girl, you know, in all, the, all those little clothes that you used to wear, plimsolls, black ones. And um, it started to rain, wind got up, and my dad, being an alpha male, oh, we're not turning round, you know, oh, this is our challenge today. So he took this little girl up, and we got lost, and we got on some really treacherous terrain. I was so scared, and also wet, that I actually piddled myself, because it was just like, oh. Anyway, we got to the top, and I always remember, when we got to the top, a feeling of excitement. I don't know whether it was excitement, I don't know whether it was really for fear. I was eight years old. And then we walked down, back to uh, the railway station, down the railway track. So we still had six miles up the road to hoof it back to the car. And then he took me home, back to the caravan. And my mother went absolutely ballistic, angry. She was so annoyed at him. And I remember giggling, you know, so oh, he's getting told off. Uh, but that night, I remember going to bed and I said to my mum, you know, mum, my next mountain, I'd really like to climb Everest. And I suppose what I did for the next several years was that I sought out trying to get back that feeling that summiting Snowden had given me. So I went off to university. I did a degree in biochemistry. I went and did a PhD in biochemistry. I was doing a research fellowship. But all through life, I played hockey. I did everything else. And I didn't have much chance to go to the mountains. I couldn't get that feeling back, that feeling of pure excitement, what it had done for me. And my well-being started to go down. It was like, well, I'm not really happy, actually. I don't particularly like doing all these studies. I remember writing up my PhD thesis, and it was like the, the closest thing I'd got to, I can't do this anymore. But I did complete it. And um, in the meantime, I just went climbing. So I went off climbing, and it was in 1998 that I got a chance to go and climb this mountain. By this time, I'd given up a research fellowship, very good job, and I was a teacher of chemistry and outdoor education. And I went off to this mountain. It's my first mountain in the Himalayas, 6,800 metres. I was totally really inexperienced for climbing such a type of mountain in winter. But I had something behind me. And I don't know whether it was luck or whatever, but we succeeded in summiting this mountain. And it gave me exactly the same feeling as that first mountain I summited when I was eight years old. It was tremendous. And I came back feeling very, very proud of myself. And that was a feeling that I enjoyed having. And the more proud I felt, the more it wanted me to increase my profile in climbing. It's, I suppose, like climbing a career ladder, right? We want to achieve, we want to get to the top. And it was in August 1999, I went off with somebody to climb this route here. Okay, so um, pretty insignificant, the climbing, it was very hard. And what I did was I made some wrong decisions because I chose a partner. Not because we got on well, but because he could climb hard. And we went off and we climbed. And we got to the top and we're coming back down and a storm came in. And to cut a very long story short, I was trying to go up to retrieve some ropes and some of my equipment fell and I took a 30 metre fall. But like this morning, I broke my pelvis, I broke my back, I broke everything. I was lying in a crevasse for 17 hours uh, thinking, actually, do you know, I'm quite pleased I've lived my life as a tiger, but I do don't want to die. And eventually I got rescued and came back. After three or four months in a wheelchair, started walking again. At this time in my life, I was a chemistry teacher in a school in Stockton-on-Tees. 
And after about four months, my headmistress said to me, OK, Adele, you either come back full time or not at all. And being sort of pretty young, being a bit fearful of losing my job, I went back into the classroom full time. And I was obviously not emotionally or physically ready to do that. I needed the money. How was I going to pay the mortgage? So I went back in, and I would just remember sort of standing there with my back on the radiator, going, oh, I've got a sore back. And the kids that I'd had a, such a good rapport with were getting the better of me. And that wasn't their behavior that was any worse. It was my physical and emotional well-being at that certain time in my life. So I decided to resign. And I thought the only way is that if I'm going to get through this is to become much fitter. So it's about this looking after me. So I, I resigned my teaching post and I became an outdoor instructor because that would allow me to do enough physical activity to recoup myself. And I wanted to live my dream. I really did. It was really important for me. I wanted to climb Everest. And I ended up becoming an expedition leader for a company called Jagged Globe. I was sent off to Kilimanjaro. I was working my way through the brochure. But really, all I wanted to do was climb Everest. I was vehicling my path through life. And I realized that the only way I could ever climb Everest was to do an 8,000 meter peak. Right? That's into the death zone. Doo -doo. I'm sure you've all heard about it. So I actually asked for unpaid leave. I'd go free, you know, to go an assistant lead on this mountain here, Chaoyu. I was given, that was granted, but two weeks before the trip was about to depart, my boss turned around and said, Adele, uh, you're not going to Choi, are you? You're going to Shishmapangma instead. And um, that took me completely out of my comfort zone. I've never been to 8,000 meter peak. Oh, I'm really, really scared now. Oh, what am I going to do? Oh, and um, I didn't say no, though. I really didn't say no, because it was like, saying no would have been defeat, even though I knew in myself that I wasn't ready for it. And I'm sure a lot of people in this room throughout their careers have been put in that situation. I went off to Shishmapangma and I felt a little bit easier when I met my three clients because um, they didn't look like mighty mountaineers. And unfortunately, or fortunately, the weather was so bad. You may have heard about the Bay of Bengal storms which just taken out 40 trekkers in Nepal. This was a Bay of Bengal storm that hit us. And you can see here that the tents are buried. That's just the top of the tents. I remember going back up to retrieve my teddy bear. But in the end, after so much bad weather, we had to quit the expedition. And it's quite funny, actually, because normally quitting makes me feel quite, huh. but in this case, it was almost a relief. So the clients went home, and I thought, I haven't finished here. I need to still go and get that 8,000 meter tick. So I took myself over to Chaoyu, and just as I arrived at base camp, I saw the, um, the Jagged Globe team had summited. I was really angry, really, really angry, because if it hadn't been for my boss who had asked me to go and do that job, I could have been with these people. And I went up, and I hid that anger, and I went up and met them up at Camp One. And I met a lady called Janet Pickett, and some others. I then decided I was going to do something very outrageous and naughty because it only had an effect on one person and that one person was me. So I told my Sherpa to leave me a tent at the top camp and a couple of days later I decided I'd wander up on my own. And at 7,000 meters here I was pretty scared and I perhaps shouldn't have been doing it but I needed to prove it to myself. I needed to have these experiences before I was going to take others or expect others to go into those zones. And within a couple of days, I'd summited Chao, I was looking over to Makalu, Everest is on the left, and I'd achieved that 8,000 meter peak tick. I came running back to the office, and as you would expect, my boss gave me a good telling off. But actually, that was a bit of an impish behavior in me, and it didn't matter. It was then that Janet Pickett got in touch with Simon and my dream started to come true because she asked Simon if I would be her one-to-one -one guide on Everest. Now, where did Janet sort of, why? Why did she ask Simon for that? I'm not quite sure. I was learning. She knew that I hadn't climbed Everest before, but she wanted me to guide her. Uh, obviously, I wasn't going to turn down the job. And in fact, this time, 
I felt very comfortable about that leadership job. So here's Everest. There's Janet and I. This is my Sherpa in crime, Mingma. Here's Janet. And you can see that we're in a big team of boys. And Janet and I were going to work together within this team. We weren't even going to try and keep up with them. We were just going to be ourselves and work independently of the rest of the team. Unfortunately, after two days, Janet tore her calf muscle. And I was thinking, oh, this is my summit bid. This is her bid. Everything's going wrong. But instead of just giving up there, what we thought we could do, and Janet is a consultant anaesthetist at Adam Brooks, right? so she knows what she's doing. We built her this assault course. And she went round and round this assault course, practicing the techniques that she would need further up on the mountain. And it was about the resilience there of saying, no, it can happen. It's about not giving up. And I used to watch Janet do this for two hours every day. Well done, Janet. Well done, Janet. And uh, we just kept going. And eventually, uh, we were ready. And we started up the mountain. Now, 16 people were killed here just a few months ago. It is the most terrifying place you will ever be in your life. I don't like it. I think my ambition to climb Everest overrid the exact sort of risk assessment of being there. It's terrifying. But this is what we do. We put ourselves right out there because of the goals that we wanted to achieve. These were the ladders. Janet really didn't like these ladders. Um, and it was all about, at this stage in my guiding, was giving Janet confidence. The other thing I needed back is confidence from her that if anything went wrong, she could help me as well. And all the jobs we do, it's about everything that the people have been talking about today. It's give and take. So we carried on up the mountain. We had to dodge these. And that's the one thing that you can't account for. You can look at other risks. But like the 40 people who got caught in the avalanches this year on the Annapurna circuit, the 16 Sherpas that got caught in the Kumbu Icefall. Yes, very sad. But I have to say, they did choose to be there. And that is the one thing that I do know with my job. It may be very dangerous, but I do choose to be there. And then we get up to Camp 1 here, and it's absolutely stunning and beautiful. Um, this is the way up Everest. And Janet and I were getting pretty excited now. We're doing pretty well on the mountain. And uh, we then went up to Camp 2, and we couldn't believe this. So talking about, we've shown quite a lot of physical re resilience, but then we get this. Uh, dear climbers, all of you are not allowed to go forward from this point till the 10th of May, 2008. And that was because the Chinese were trying to put the Olympic torch on the summit. Can you imagine what emotional feelings that was? I was like, oh. So I tested it a little bit. I said, no, you're only joking. And when a rifle came out, I walked back and said, no, they're not joking. And Janet went absolutely ballistic. It was a bit like listening to my mum shout at my stepdad all those years ago. But she wasn't blaming the Chinese. She was blaming me. And this was her initial reaction. And my initial reaction was to keep quiet and not to argue. High on Everest is not the place to argue. Base camp, we can argue. And I remember Janet and I coming down in silence. And then Janet saying, I need some more oxygen, because she is a consultant anaesthetist. So she went down the valley, and I stayed up high. But on the 8th of May, um, the Chinese summited. I said, come on, Janet, we've got to go back up. So we ended up going back up the mountain. Um, we're talking 40 days now of being there, up and down, round about, disappointments. And you get up to the south summit, and this is where it's, can I be bothered? I will say um, that we've got to be bothered. It's about caring, isn't it? Sometimes you know you've really got to do a job, and actually, can you be bothered? But here, checking every one of these cylinders, I had to be bothered, because that was somebody's life or an abandoned summit attempt. Or it could have been my life, because I could have picked the oxygen bottle up that somebody had snuck away, used, and put back. So it's about being bothered. And then I remember that night, Janet. This is her. This is at the end of her physical and emotional resilience. I remember saying, Janet, she goes, Adele, what happens if I don't summit? Or I can't do it. I said, Janet, I'm your guide. I come back down with you. There's not a problem. 
And then, but just something I knew that it would happen. And what we're going to do now, ladies and gentlemen, fingers crossed, is go to the summit of Everest. No. Oh. Yeah, you can click it again. From the side for long. Oh shoot, is that easy? Just click it again. So this is us at the South Coal. We've jumped a few hours now, probably about 12 hours. This is the first team summiting. And these are the sort of conditions that I work in quite regularly. Whoa. As a memory excuse. That's James, who thought if he summited the mountain, he'd get a better class of woman. He's still not married. Eight years later. So, people, you never ever have to go to the summit of Everest. Actually, not that anybody would dream of doing it. This is the main expedition leader, David Hamilton, a very experienced guide and expedition leader. Seven minutes past five in the morning on the 23rd of May 2008. It's the third summit day of this year at Passang and me and the first people on the top just after five o'clock in the morning. 20 mile an hour winds, otherwise lovely and clear. So you can see that oxygen's quite an important part of life up here, but just to give you some views. Not many people have seen or been to the summit of Everest, but at least when you go home tonight, you've done something. This is probably the most extreme height that I'll work at. And here's Janet and I. We're about two hours behind the main team, but we didn't mind. We were fit. We're just plodding away. I'm having a discussion there that I'm not going to go on the outside. I like to look after my clients. And we're not normal size. I'm 4 foot 11, 54 kilos. Probably a bit more now after that lovely lunch. And Janet's the same. We do struggle. This is what it's like coming down. Somebody told me it was a walk in the park. I'm not so sure of that. It's simple as that, actually. I always say to my clients, we don't fall, because if we fall, we die. This is the famous Hillary step. It gets a bit crowded at times, and that's somebody who got it wrong. Anyway, Janet and I carried on, and here we are at the South Summit. Just have to show these. I'm quite proud of these. Hillary step. And there was Janet on the summit. Her lifelong dream, something that she'd been doing, the completion of the seven summits. This con a, um, consultant anaesthetist from Adam Brooks Hospital. It was amazing. And I suppose it was being asked to do this conference that made me think about, you know, what did that actually do for Janet? You know, me and Janet go climbing every year now. Uh, we're good friends. I'm not surprised after spending 72 days in each other's company 24-7 and she's still shouting at me. But I asked her, so Janet, why did you want to climb Everest? And do you think it helped your well-being? I didn't think of climbing Everest until the fourth of her seven summits. So she didn't actually start out to do it. But it was Neil who encouraged me to do it and said that I could. So somebody had given her that encouragement to say that she could cope with it. Did it help my well-being? Yes, afterwards. I think it would be pushing it to say it helped me whilst being struggling up the lotsy face with frozen hands, waves of nausea, a torn calf muscle and lumps of ice raining on me from above. So, yes, it did affect her well-being in the end. Why did you ask Adele to be your guide? I thought she was an experienced and careful mountaineer who would be willing to listen and discuss my ideas. Anxieties about climbing the mountain. I also thought she'd be fun and I am taller than her. Janet's about three inches taller than me. 
And then um, I just sort of come up with something else she said was, uh, do you think mountaineering helps well-being? For me, yes. I love being outdoors and the fabulous views on offer. I enjoy and feel better after exercise. Scary or challenging parts of the climb may not be enjoyable at the time, but once completed, are a form of accomplishment that brings happiness. For some individuals, however, like my little sister, she would rather be on a sandy beach in the sunshine and regards me as mad. Do you think Adele is crazy? She can be, thanks, Janet. Uh, but she has a lucid and sensitive moments too. So it's all about things that I believe increase well-being. Uh, maybe not at the time. There's me and Ted on the summit as well, just to show you that I was there. The following year, I did something that certainly didn't improve my well-being. I was asked by my boss to lead Everest again, but this time it wasn't one to guide one-to-one -one guiding, it was leading a trip of 13 trekkers and 13 clients, one of which was a woman. We went off and I was, had two assistant leaders. Willie Benegas here is known as the, Ever, uh, the Everest of God or God of Everest. Um, he's like been there seven or eight times, but he was put in an assistant leadership role. I should have realised then there was no way that I would be able to lead an expedition um, in the way I wanted to lead it. And things went wrong, not with the team or anything else like that, but with my leadership of other leaders. So this was a management thing that was going horribly wrong, not a client thing. And uh, it was a very unhappy trip for me. I really didn't enjoy being put in that position. And um, what I did enjoy, though, was putting Amanda on the summit, the oldest British female. And we had nine out of 13 clients who summited Everest that year. Nobody was injured. Nobody had frostbite. Everybody came back, I thought, reasonably happy. And I went back to work, and I was pretty chuffed, actually. You know, nine people on the top, not bad. Yes, there'd been some problems at base camp with myself and Willie Benegas, um, but everybody came back alive. And then my boss wasn't speaking to me. He wasn't sort of saying anything. He was really off with me. I mean, he would be arguing a bit, and he'd just like look at me with disgust when he saw me. I knew there was something up. So actually one day I confronted him and said, right, what's, what's the matter? What's getting you? He said, well, I have had the worst piece of feedback I have ever had from any leader. I said, would, would you like to show me it? And he goes, no. I said, well, please can you show me it? And I think a week later, he flung me an email. I read the email and I was like, gutted, because this is perhaps the nicest things that were said. I was scared to be on the mountain with her. I did not want her decisions influencing my climbing. Now you can read the est. She had no business guiding. In fact, I'd never spent much time with this gentleman. He'd spent it with the other two expedition leaders. He'd sort of segregated himself from the rest of the team and he spent it with the base camp manager and the two other leaders who sort of, it was a bit like big brother, get me out of here. That's how I felt. But I was determined that I was in there with the rest of the team. But he did say some nice things, actually. Um, so I was, it was quite, oh, well, cheers, mate. But what happened at work was I never felt that I got a fair trial. My boss never, ever discussed this email with me and um, I never got the chance to guide again at 8,000 metres. So what I did instead was I actually just said, I can't cope with this. It sent me bizarre. I must admit, I was going home on a night. I was crying. I was doing all those things that people have mentioned today, you know, started drinking a little bit too much. My life was going to pots. And instead of going down the barrel, because I personally don't suffer from depression, I decided to get out. So I got out, I resigned, and then I went off to climb another mountain. I started my own business and went off to climb a mountain called Makalu. So I thought, right, I'm not going to guide. I've been told I'm a crap guide. You know, it's like, you take these feelings personally. And uh, unfortunately, I went off on a cheap trip to Makalu. And we'd had a few problems. And it was just below the summit that I became very ill. And we ended up having to go down. I was dragged across the mountain and left in a high tent to die. The expedition leader said to me, 
oh, somebody will come up and fetch you. At that time in the mountain, there was other two expeditionary members lost on the mountain. And eventually, I crawled down from the camp, met one of the guys who also had serious frostbite, and it took us three days to descend. I wasn't well. I didn't know what was going on with me. I really didn't, because this wasn't emotional. In fact, I felt really emotionally strong. I was just physically ill. And this is a picture of me when we got the news that Harris, one of the other guys, had died. But actually, shall I tell you something? I didn't care, because all I knew was that I was dying as well. I got my back, myself back to Kathmandu with no support of the others, and then uh, came back to the UK and went to my GP three days running. He, he sent me home with paracetamol and Nurofen. On the third night, I was screaming in agony. I went to Chesterfield Hospital. You know those hatches that you go to in casualty? And the woman, it was like midnight, and she opened the catch, and I went, I think I'm dying. And I collapsed. And they did all sorts of tests. Basically, my, I had an upside-down PRT wave, all these things. I spent two weeks in intensive care, and it was just horrendous. Um, and after three months, I still wasn't getting better. They'd given me loads and loads of antibiotics. And I text a doctor friend who's into high-altitude medicine. I said, David, I need some help. And uh, eventually, something happened. And I was in Sheffield Northern General. They cut me open, not very pleasant, and removed a massive empyema from my lung. And for those people who are not medics, that means a big abscess around my left lung. Because what had happened was my left lung had collapsed. And that's why I probably didn't feel too well, actually, especially at 8,000 metres. So, um, but this time, unlike before, when my world fell apart, I didn't, wasn't going to let it fall apart. I wanted to get back out there. And I realised that the mountains mean so much to me, and my job meant so much to me, that I had to work hard at it. So me and my bear went up to, started climbing again, and my mum paid me for me to go back to Makalu. I went back to Makalu, different type of trip, much more team, much more bonding, fantastic leadership. I was learning all the time from these leaders. I even took my teddy bear, obviously, something to talk to, and he took his friends as well. Very, very important, people, is to have people that you trust with you. But you can see here that I was stronger. We all learn lessons through life. And I think one of the things is we've got to believe in ourselves, but we have got to listen and we have got to learn lessons. And there I was on the summit of Makalu. Funny enough, I am always the shortest. And I did get my job back leading 8,000 meter peaks. Funny that, isn't it? Because now I've been back and proved myself. And I took two people off to Lotsey. Here's Ron and Scott. Unfortunately, something out of my control happened. That was a big avalanche, folks. Um, and we were very, very lucky. We were in our tents at that stage. And if it hadn't have been for the high quality tents, uh, we wouldn't be here today. And Scott decided, as he said to me, um, I've got a wife, I've got two children and two golden retrievers, and I'd rather go home economy than freight. Ron, on the other side, blamed everything else. Um, but actually, they'd met their resilience. They'd met their emotional and physical resilience in the mountain. But on this particular occasion, I knew that this was a risk that was just happening. I didn't have control of it. And we've talked about that today, isn't it? If you don't have control about it, you're either not going to worry about it. And so I continued. After doing a rescue of a Sherpa, at high altitude, I gave up my summit bid to help go and help Pem at 7,000 metres, who'd been hit by a block of ice. There he is, Pem. He thought he'd lost his job as well. Pem the Sherpa is now back working. I went back down to base camp and waited for a week until the weather was better and that I'd recharge my batteries and let my body just give it some rest. So it's all about patience as well. And there was patience in there, and then I went off again. And then I got stuck in this bloody queue. It's like Sainsbury's. <laughs> and this picture was in the Telegraph. Yes, what has Everest become? Luckily, I was strong enough to zip past people. You know, you dodge them in and out. This is commercial mountaineering. I'm not, that's a completely different topic. I'm not going to go on to that at all. But I am the only 11th person in Britain to have that photo. 
And that's a picture of Everest from the summit of Lhotse. So resilience there, but emotional, physical, whatever you call, taking risk, everything um, that have enabled me really to do my job. I'm very proud of my job. I still take people into the mountains and it's all I can see myself doing until um, I do need new knees. But things I've learnt really, I have learnt where my boundaries are. I know when to take time out. I know when I've got to go. I sat here all day. It was great to listen to everybody, but I knew that I had to go and take half an hour out to compose myself. I'm ha happy to sit and wait. I can sit and wait for every. I can count Pertex squares in a tent. There's two and a half million Pertex squares in the inside of a little tent. So it's about that ability to think of nothing. Okay? I tend to seek out company now that I enjoy being with when I'm climbing for myself. I don't take risks when I'm out there on my own. I like to be with friends who understand me and clients. I never admit to knowing all the answers because I don't. I don't know when those avalanches are going to hit. People say, what's the weather going to be like? And I'm like, www.god.com, eh? He knows. But um, I try to work with people's strengths rather than their weaknesses, right? I'm not the tallest. Like that guy said, she wasn't the strongest. No, I'm not the strongest. How can I be the strongest? And like with my clients, but some people have much more emotional resilience than physical. Okay? I realised that it's not a fair world out there. I learned that pretty young, actually. Um, and I let a lot of things pass over me. When I was in my 20s, I used to argue a lot. I don't anymore. I also treat myself. Okay? I do like Duca's IPA. Just remember that. Okay? And um, I do have inanimate objects to talk to. Ted's my saviour. He looks after me, and I talk to him. Sorry, boys, it's all very emotional stuff. Um, but the one thing that is really striking is that I care passionately about people. I want to improve their mental health and being. I want to improve them physically. My job as a mountaineering instructor guide, I can almost say, is 90% counselling and 10% climbing. We spend a lot more time chatting on the walk-ins, chatting at base camp. And it's about making people feel really positive about themselves. But I don't expect that sort of care back when we're in my extreme environment. When things go wrong, which they can do, I talk about them. I admit my mistakes and try to move on. And the last thing, I'd never return to Everest to guide. I firmly believe that it is now too dangerous to go through that icefall. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.